and uh, for the next talk, I would like to present uh, Serge Vodonet, and uh, he's a cryptographer uh, researcher in uh, EPFL in Switzerland. And in addition to his numerous works on cryptographic primitive, uh, Serge has already, all, also been studying distant bounding uh, algorithms for quite some time. And those algorithms try to offer security based on the location of device. Uh, for example, try to make sure that the key is actually very close to uh, the car and that there are no uh, relay techs or, um, uh, that try to bypass these uh, defenses. And we'll now hear um, his thoughts about uh, contact tracing and specifically uh, the COVID safe app. So, um, Serge, do you want to share your screen? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, I won't talk about COVID safe at all. Uh, so my talk will mostly be about Swiss COVID, which is a Swiss app. Uh, so and if I can share my screen, here it is. Oops, it's not this one. Talk doesn't work. What's the problem? Where is my desktop? Uh, okay. So this is my presentation. So it's a uh, joint work with my colleague uh, Martin Vuagnou. Uh, so in this presentation, uh, I will uh, talk about uh, Swiss COVID, which is a Swiss uh, automated contact tracing app. Uh, that we have been uh, running for a couple of months here in Switzerland. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that many people uh, have already heard about all the good things about Swiss COVID. So in this talk, I will try to make an opposite uh, approach and talk about the dark side of Swiss COVID. Uh, just to note, I'm from EPFL and EPFL uh, has a lot of uh, conflict of interest with Swiss COVID. So if I say something, please don't say that EPFL said so because it's most likely that EPFL would say the opposite. Uh, so uh, with this in mind, so I will start first by talking about the con context of Swiss COVID. Uh, uh, you have already heard the uh, or present introducing the problem of uh, of uh, contact tracing. Essentially, the problem is the epidemic uh, we are uh, all suffering of that we are living in. And uh, to defeat this uh, pandemic, uh, governments are given some means by law to fight against the pandemic. And uh, there are some laws for that. And in EPFL, it's like in many other countries, we have a law on epidemics. And what this law is saying, it gives some means to the government to defeat the pandemic. And one of them is, uh, consists of saying that after a positive diagnosis, there is an obligation to report the identity of a diagnosed person, people and the people they may have contaminated. Essentially, this law is saying that the privacy of some people can be uh, reduced uh, in order to fight against the pandemic. So it is explicitly a law which is reducing some human rights, can reduce the privacy, can uh, re reduce the freedom uh, of movement by locking down people. It can uh, reduce lots of other human rights as well. Uh, there are some restrictions and the restriction consists of saying that all those measures must be necessary and reasonable. Of course, there is no precise definition of necessary and uh, reasonable means, but uh, these, these are the uh, limitation of uh, usage of, of this. And it is subject to lots of debates and most of the disputes that uh, we can uh, hear this time. So we have uh, uh, to reduce the privacy of people. And uh, for that, we rely on contact tracing. So the traditional contact tracing consists of uh, having uh, people to investigate on other people. And uh, it is a non-trivial job. It consists of establishing a trust relationship with a diagnosed person uh, and uh, to, to give some advices. And it's a tedious work. It requires some time. It's costly. And for that reason, people are looking for ways to uh, to make this process uh, automated. So this is why we need automated contact tracing. So that's the context uh, of this. And in uh, Switzerland, so we had the TP3T project. 
which uh, started at the early uh, beginning of the uh, pandemic. The purpose of this DPC 3T uh, project was to uh, alert users who have been in close proximity of a confirmed COVID-19 positive case for a prolonged duration. So it's a quote from uh, the white papers that you can find on this URL. There are also a list of non-goals for this project, like uh, it's not a goal to track positive cases at all. It's not a goal to locate clusters. So this app will not help at all for that. And it's not a goal either to share data with epidemiologists. So this used to be a goal in the beginning of DP3T, but in the latest version of the white paper, this goal has been dropped. So the app is now explicitly not giving anything to epidemiology, epidemiologists, mo most likely because of the Apple and Google restrictions. So this is a dp project, and this project made some choices. So one choice was to rely on smartphones. It could have relied on other devices. And one choice was to rely on the Bluetooth technology to uh, detect proximity and the other uh, goals that uh, we have been talking about already uh, today is to have decentralized uh, architecture, which means to store data locally on a smartphone, most, most, uh, uh, mostly on a smartphone. So that's a dp uh, project and uh, the uh, achievement of this project was to have Swiss COVID, but from dp to Swiss COVID, it was a very long uh, road. So dp was announced in early April. It was actually one subpart of a European project, PEPPT. So PEPPT was a European project, but after a few days of running this project, uh, they realized that there was a dispute between uh, people from DP3T and other people from PEPPT, and they split because DP3T uh, wanted to promote decentralized systems and other people in PEPPT uh, were promoting centralized one. So uh, then uh, it uh, appears very uh, quite uh, uh, early that there would be a problem to develop uh, Bluetooth solutions because to have access to the Bluetooth uh, interface on smartphones, there are some restrictions and those restrictions are not put because of the hardware, it's put because of the operating system. So actually Apple and Google are controlling the access to the Bluetooth interface. At the very beginning, Apple and Google said that they would help to implement decentralized system and only decentralized system and at this time, people thought that, uh, okay, so Apple and Google will uh, give access, will give full access to the Bluetooth interface to people developing decentralized solutions. But surprise, it didn't happen this way. Instead of giving access to the Bluetooth interface, Apple and Google just implemented the, uh, the protocol by themselves. So now, what is left to be done by the app is almost nothing. So the app is only an interface between the Apple and Google uh, implementation, the user and the server. Uh, it has uh, uh, very little to do technically. So if you look at what is this app is doing, it's doing almost nothing. So uh, then uh, uh, another development in Switzerland was the, the legal problem. So when the government wanted to deploy this type of solution, uh, the parliament said, no way, we need a legal basis. So for this reason, the parliament uh, has uh, uh, established a new article to be put in the law on epidemics. And this uh, new article, which was uh, uh, added in an emergency and quite uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, we can have a look at what it says. So this, uh, this new article says that other usage of this infrastructure is forbidden. So this uh, architecture must be used only for, for the intended purpose, which is automated contact tracing and showing the proximity for in a prolonged manner. Uh, it has to be voluntary. So we cannot force people to use this uh, solution and discrimination of people based on whether they use it or not is forbidden. So there is just one exception. People who use it and who are notified can have a free uh, COVID-19 test. So if they want to be diagnosed, 
the test will be free for them. So that's the only uh, exception for the discrimination, otherwise discrimination is forbidden. Uh, this article also says that uh, users should not be identified, it must be decentralized, it shouldn't uh, use any geolocalization, so it's Bluetooth only. Uh, the data which is stored must be erased when it's no longer necessary. Something very important is that the source code must be public and verifiable, so it was a surprise to add unverifiable, it was not intended at the very beginning. Uh, and it must be the case for all the components of the architecture. So it means that anyone can just go and see the uh, source code and verify that this source code is what is actually implemented. So it must be verifiable and for all components. So it also says that the specifications must be available as well for all components. So it means uh, all the components which are in the smartphones and also the servers. Uh, and this, all the, the architecture. Uh, the law says that the law on data protection applies, the government is in charge of details, and the entire system must be shut down when it's no longer useful or inefficient. So one problem that we have is that there is no measure of efficiency, so it's not clear how we would establish that it's inefficient uh, or not. Uh, if we come back to the uh, voluntary basis, we can wonder uh, what uh, the uh, what choice is uh, left to people. So, which choice uh, do people have? So, they have the choice to install or not install the app. Uh, when they install it, they have the choice to activate it or not to activate it. If they are notified, uh, if they, there is a proximity to some people uh, um, infected and notified, they have the choice to react or not. So they are suggested to, to call an info line, they are uh, suggested to, uh, uh, to isolate themselves, uh, they have to volunteer for that, they are suggested to have a test. So they receive lots of information, but there is nothing mandatory, it's, uh, it's really voluntary. Uh, if someone is diagnosed and he's using Swiss COVID, he has uh, uh, the opportunity to report or not to report. So it's also a choice. And when he reports, he can also select which days uh, are to report. So he, if he selects one day, it would report all the contacts that he had during uh, uh, the, uh, all the keys that he has been using during this day. And all his contact will be informed about it. Uh, what is not optional is to obey to some uh, quarantine or isolation orders when they are ordered by authorities. So the app will not order that, so the app is, uh, doesn't have the authority for that. But uh, if someone is uh, contacting uh, the uh, info line, so it may be the case that later the authority order to, uh, to have a quarantine or isolation. Okay. So that's the context of uh, Swiss COVID. Uh, now we can uh, have a look at uh, how it works. Uh, so very uh, uh, roughly, so people are uh, using their app to exchange some ephemeral identifiers all the time, so it's done permanently. And those identifiers are random numbers, so they change frequently, like every, every 15 minutes roughly. And these uh, numbers are sent uh, uh, all the time at uh, two, two to three times per second. So it's something which, uh, which is really impressive. Uh, so here you can see that this guy is broadcasting his number to his neighbor. So, and this person uh, broadcasting this number to his, his uh, her only neighbor. What happens is that if uh, this person gets sick, so she will get a test, and if she is diagnosed, mm -hmm. she will receive one code which allows her to report. So uh, again, it's voluntary. So this code is called a COVID code in the Swiss COVID terminology. And with this COVID code, she will be able to upload on a server all the keys that uh, were used to generate all those ephemeral identifiers, so key of each day which were uh, generating those identifiers. So they will be posted on the built-in board and everyone will be able to download them. So this guy will download 
and uh, it will be able to derive all the ephemeral identifiers that this person has been using during the day and it will compare to whatever he receives. It would be no match, but for this person, he will recognize one number that he has received and he will have a notification. So this is how it works. Uh, of course, it's very simplified. So in practice, it's a bit more complicated because they, they are using smartphones and in the smartphones, there are many things. There is this app and there is this Google and Apple notification uh, Google and Apple exposure notification. So the name is uh, changing. So maybe now people call it ENS, but uh, because of my background, I have some difficulties to use this acronym. Uh, so in the telephone, there is this app and this uh, Google and Apple notification. Google and Apple notification is implemented everything which relates to Bluetooth. So it generates the keys, it uh, generates uh, the daily keys, it generates the identifier, it's broadcasting the identifier, it's receiving other identifier, it's storing them. Uh, when the app here download from the server the keys, it gives them to uh, Google and Apple exposure notification and Google and Apple exposure notification will compare to whatever is stored and report to the app. And based on the report, the app will decide to notify or not. So the only technical thing the app has to do is to decide to report based on the report by Google and Apple exposure notification. Uh, actually, uh, there, is, uh, there are some operations which are a bit more complicated. Uh, okay, so I've already mentioned that. The upload part to the server is a bit more complicated. So if when this person is diagnosed, the health infrastructure will get from the server a COVID code and will give it to this person. So this COVID code is a 12 digit COVID code. So it can be written, it can be given by telephone or uh, in a note. So it's, and, and then this person will have to enter on her uh, app and what, uh, what this app will do is that this app will contact the server. The server will verify that this COVID code is correct. And in return, it will give a token. So it's a JSON token, JWT. And with this uh, token, the person will be able to upload to the server. So this token is a credential from this server that this person is authorized to upload. So COVID code is something which is a, a one-time code. It's, uh, it can be used only once on this server and it's valid for 24 hours. So when this person receives her code, she has 24 hours to uh, use it. After that, it's no longer valid. So that's how this upload is working. Uh, fortunately, there are not so many people who are diagnosed and who are uploading. So this operation is, uh, is, uh, is not uh, too complicated to do from a networking perspective. But for the download part, it's more complicated because you have millions of users who need to look at the bulletin board very frequently. So this has to be done through a content delivery network in Switzerland is maintained by Amazon. So Amazon is uh, looking at the bulletin board and the bulletin board gives some keys and those keys are signed by the bulletin board. And this uh, Amazon is uh, giving to everyone, uh, all those signed keys. So this infrastructure, you can see that it's not so simple. And, uh, and the specification of all this infrastructure uh, are, uh, are very short. So we have to guess how it works exactly. So this is how Swiss COVID works. Now, what kind of problem can we have with Swiss COVID? So these are the possible attacks uh, or problems uh, that uh, we can have. Uh, there are several types uh, of uh, problems and one problem is uh, to is that someone could uh, make people receive some fake alert notifications. So when they receive some alerts, they maybe they will isolate and if you create some fake alerts to people, those people will isolate and maybe you can get some advantage. So for instance, if there are uh, competitors uh, maybe will get an advantage because those people are suddenly isolated. So this is a false exposure notification problem. You can have many uh, scenarios like for instance some terrorists or activists uh, who want to shut down an entire city or 
country or company or whatever, uh, they can try to uh, uh, broadcast some uh, some identifier to many people in a, in a, in a blind way. So, uh, what they could do is that they could make a, a device. Uh, they could make several devices which would be synchronized and who will use who will all use exactly the same identifiers to be sent to people. And then these people, they can go to public places where there are many people, like for instance, uh, in, in trains, in public transport during rush hours, or in, uh, in, in other places where there are many people, and they can broadcast those ephemeral identifiers with uh, a high energy to make sure that many people will receive it and think that they are very close. And later on, after they succeeded to broadcast their ephemeral identifiers to many people, one member of this group can sacrifice his, himself and get sick and diagnosed. And when he reports, then you will have many people who will receive a fake uh, alert. So that's a problem. You can have a variant of this attack where you, you can target a bit more precisely who you want to receive a fake uh, notification. Uh, so if you get close to someone and you send your ephemeral identifier, if you want this person to receive a fake notification, then you will have to falsify a report to the server. So you can have some attacks consisting of sending some false reports to the server. So one way is to try to falsify a, a positive test and then you will get a COVID code from the health infrastructure. You can also try to buy a COVID code of someone who has been diagnosed and who didn't use yet his COVID code. So those COVID codes are uh, usable for 24 hours. There is no connection with a person who was tested. You can also corrupt the medical infrastructure and to try to get some free COVID codes. Uh, in uh, Swiss COVID, there was also a bug uh, in the uploading uh, part uh, when you report some keys, so you upload uh, with a JSON token to the server. So in this uh, request, in the upload request, there was a field algorithm that you could set to null. And the effect of setting this algorithm to null was meaning to the server, don't verify. So essentially, you could just bypass the verification and submit whatever you want. So it was a bug, which was uh, uh, fortunately discovered and corrected. but you can see that this type of attack is sometimes possible. You can also, uh, instead of uh, trying to uh, submit a false report, you can try to replay or relay the identifier of someone who is likely to get sick, to, get, to be diagnosed soon. Like you can try to collect uh, the identifiers of people who are waiting in some emergency room in a hospital because they are likely to be diagnosed soon and you can uh, use it to broadcast it to and to send it to your target. And uh, this person is likely to receive a false notification later on. So here you, you try to, to create a fake encounter because someone who, we, who will genuinely be diagnosed and uh, the target, so it's a fake encounter. So that's one kind of problem which can happen uh, in uh, with uh, Swiss COVID. Another uh, type of problem is the uh, loss of privacy for some people. So you have loss of privacy for people who are reporting. Someone who reports is someone who will post all the ephemeral identifiers that he has been using uh, in a recent past. So uh, these, those persons, they essentially go public. Uh, we can imagine what we call the paparazzi attack, where a paparazzi would try to uh, identify which celebrity has been diagnosed. For that, these paparazzi just have to uh, approach uh, celebrities to try to get some ephemeral identifier of each celebrity. The paparazzi doesn't necessarily have to be very close, not very long. It needs to catch a Bluetooth signal of the telephone of the celebrities. And after he collects all these identifiers of celebrities, he just have to watch at the Bulletin board to see if a celebrity has uh, be became diagnosed and reported. This type of attack uh, can be done also by uh, anyone who would like to, uh, to uh, identify who 
has been diagnosed among his contact. Uh, that's uh, what I call the nerd attack. So that's an attack where someone would try to enrich his app. So the Swiss COVID app doesn't store so much, but you could try to store a bit more. So when we, when you, uh, you use Swiss COVID, you will uh, only store ephemeral IDs, but you could also store the location where you have stored this ID, uh, wh when you have uh, obtained this ID, and possibly with whom. So if you know who you are enc encountering, you, you can just uh, record uh, this uh, information. So you can have an app which store more data and when you uh, receive uh, an alert or if you see, uh, uh, maybe if you had an encounter which is not significant, but uh, you have met someone who was diagnosed, you can recognize it even though Swiss COVID does not necessarily alert you. So this, uh, this is a privacy loss for people who report this uh, data also can be shared in a group. So this is a kind of militia attack. If you have a, a bunch of people who'd like to collect all the uh, collected data, uh, uh, then they can uh, easily identify uh, people who report and maybe do some discrimination. Uh, this attack can be done also by companies, hotels or shop or anyone who is identifying someone at some point. So when you uh, when you go to some hotel at the uh, 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 registration you identify in a company when you enter you identify either as a visitor or as an employee uh, in a shop when you pay you identify either by your credit card number or by your loyalty card so at every place where you identify someone could be also collecting an FMR identifier from your Swiss COVID app and later recognize if you have become uh, diagnosed and reported. So that's also uh, a privacy threat. You can also connect uh, this uh, ephemeral ID collection with a video surveillance so that when you spot someone who has become sick, then you can uh, find a video of this person. Uh, you can also have some Bluetooth sniffers. So here that's a picture of a simulation of this type of uh, sniffer in uh, Helsinki, where every circle corresponds to a collected ephemeral identifier and each red one corresponds to someone who reported. So you can clearly see here the movement of someone along a street uh, uh, of someone who, who was reported. So that's a privacy loss for people who report. You also have privacy loss for every user because every users are now forced to use Bluetooth. If they want to use Swiss COVID, they need to turn on Bluetooth. And when you turn on Bluetooth, you have lots of privacy loss as uh, Vanessa said. So now you can have some apps which are variant of the game uh, Pokemon Go where people would chase uh, Swiss COVID users instead of chasing Pokemon. So it can be funny. Uh, it's of course a privacy loss for users because uh, now you can discriminate users and non-users, also it's, uh, it's against the law. You can have the Bluetooth sniffers I've mentioned in the previous slides, but you can also use those sniffers to track devices and uh, see their movements. So if you have a network of sniffers, this network can be made either by sensor or by apps running on the smartphones of people. So with this network of sniffer, you can uh, trace the movement of uh, other people. So essentially you can collect a lot of information like the ephemeral identifiers, so location, time, and all the extra data. And this could be a privacy loss for all the users. Uh, the final problem uh, is, uh, is very similar to what uh, Vanessa mentioned about COVID safe is a problem of does Swiss COVID work at all? And we, uh, it's, it's not clear uh, at all that it's, uh, it's really working. So it's a problem of false positive and negative. So just like in COVID safe, the goal was to uh, track proximity. Proximity means at a distance up to 1.5 meter uh, to uh, uh, during a uh, total time, uh, which exceeds 15 minutes. Uh, during the same day. So it can be three different uh, person doing five minutes each. 
uh, or one uh, person doing 15 minutes. It's just the sum of the duration which has to exceed 15 minutes. So if your total is 14 minutes and 59 seconds, you're safe. But uh, as long as you reach 15 minutes, then you're in danger. So that's the goal for Swiss COVID. And the problem is that this distance of 1.5 meter, so there is no rule to measure it. It's measured by Bluetooth, and Bluetooth is not meant to measure distances. So the distance is essentially guessed. So there is no measurement. So distance is guessed based on the attenuation of the Bluetooth signal. So it's very imprecise, and we have no clue if most of uh, detections are at the correct distance. Uh, it was reported that there were people living together using Swiss COVID. Uh, one uh, reported, one was diagnosed and reported, and the other was not uh, notified at all. Uh, so, and there was also a paper, so it's a preprint as far as I know, uh, which says that uh, they have tried in a real experiment in a tram, and their conclusion was that it was uh, uh, working very randomly. It was not working so well. So, uh, so far we don't know. So people uh, developing Swiss COVID, they claim that it's working, but so far we have seen no evidence. So this is it's just claims we see no results, no data. Uh, what we can see is that uh, in the Swiss COVID infrastructure, so there are some parameters and at some point, uh, during the deployment, I think it was uh, more than one month ago, uh, the parameters have been changed. So the authority decided to change the parameter to increase the sensitivity. So we don't know if they have changed the distance, which would be weird because the distance is, uh, is graved in uh, marble in the, in the law. Uh, so we, we don't know if now the catch at a distance larger than 1.5 meter or less, uh, but uh, the, these, uh, those parameters were increased. So we don't know if uh, Swiss COVID is working at all. So we just hope it works. What, what if it doesn't work? So I have a good news. I can give you a very good way to replace Swiss COVID if it doesn't work. It's uh, to eat garlic. So at the very beginning of the pandemic, maybe you have seen people rushing on garlic because they, they, they thought it was uh, 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 helping for, for the pandemic. And the truth is that it really helps for against the virus. It has absolutely no effect, but if you eat garlic as, as much as I do, you can be sure that you will meet no one during the day. So you, there will be no one at a distance of 1.5 meter. If it doesn't work, there is a, a even more powerful measure, which is the Marwal cheese, which, which I recommend you. Uh, so it could be a good alternative to replace. So in uh, contact tracing, there are other techniques which I won't discuss. So one was consisting of using private set intersection instead of putting all the ephemeral IDs in clear. Uh, one question if it, if it is scalable, uh, it was claimed that it was doable, but we, we didn't have seen so much uh, work in this direction so far. And the other idea was to use a Diffie-Hellman protocol because with the Diffie-Hellman protocol, you see no connection between what is posted and the uh, FML IDs that you have seen. Okay, uh, but I won't talk about this. I would like to talk about what problem uh, occurred in reality. So I've, uh, I've discussed about uh, possible problems, but what did happen? So, uh, if you remember, I mentioned that at the beginning, there was a problem of the access to the Bluetooth interface and the problem of PayPT being successful to promote centralized system to many governments. So it was a, a problem for DP3. So what happened is that there was a kind of pact between this DP3 uh, project and some powerful uh, organization with uh, Apple and Google and because of that, so the DP3T became very successful. So they get a lot of fame. Uh, it was really affecting uh, during a, a, a few weeks, but you know the story after that, then problem occurs uh, because this guy, maybe he has some uh, other uh, projects and this is what's happening. So Apple and Google, instead of giving access to the Bluetooth interface, they implemented. And then there was a problem. There was a problem of the compatibility with the law 
because Apple and Google didn't release their source code. And the, the law was saying that all components must have a uh, uh, public uh, source code, public and verifiable source code. So because of that, uh, after the law was adopted, the government has to make an ordinance to twist a bit the law to make an exception for the Google and Apple exposure notification, which is exempting for publishing the source code. Uh, nevertheless, after uh, uh, several weeks, actually quite recently, Apple and Google published some source code. Uh, one problem is that the published source codes are not complete or not exactly the one which are used. So it's, uh, it's not verifiable. So it's either some example of source code, it's not exactly the one which are used, or this is, uh, these are uh, partial source codes, it's not complete. Uh, what can happen is that this implementation by Apple and Google can be, can be subject to change without any notification and people have uh, no way to control it, to verify it. Uh, the, on the Android, this implementation is part of the Google Play services. Google Play services is some kind of app which is running in a telephone. It's not the operating system as people have claimed. So the implementation doesn't run in the operating system of Android. You can have Android without uh, this, with this part. Uh, so, and this Google Play services is some kind of super app, which is useful for all the Google uh, other apps. And this is an app which is really terrible from a privacy perspective. It is an app which is sending permanently the IP address the phone number, the email address, the number of the telephone, the SIM card number, etc. It is really scary app from a privacy perspective. So when you, we try to compare the uh, privileges of an app like Swiss COVID with some other apps, the comparison is really unfair because the app is doing nothing. The app is doing on the implementation, which is part of another app, which is really scary in terms of uh, uh, permission and privacy. Uh, sometimes there are some also weird decisions like, like Apple recently, uh, which decided to send a weekly notification to users about all the encounters that they had. And this notification is conflicting with the notification from the app. So now Apple is sending a report which is confusing people because it's sometimes conflicting with what the app is saying. And soon, uh, uh, what is happening now is that uh, the app will be fully integrated in the Google and Apple exposure notification. It will be called uh, Exposure Notification Express. Uh, with Exposure Notification Express, there will not be any need for an additional app at all. So it's claimed to be easier for everyone, but it won't be easier for citizens. So now if citizens are unhappy about the app, they can complain to their governments that they elected. But if they're unhappy about the exposure notification express, they cannot. So they didn't elect uh, Apple and Google. Uh, other problems which occurred is that uh, there, there were a few bugs, of course, uh, uh, sorry. Um, so there, at the beginning, there were a few uh, bugs, like some uh, weird uh, errors. Uh, uh, Bluetooth, uh, we have seen in some phones that uh, the app was looking like working, but in fact, it was not. So this app was uh, well uh, sending some uh, ephemeral identifiers, mm -hmm. but in fact, it was not receiving any, okay? Sometimes you can have a telephone with the app running, which looks like running, but it does nothing. It does not receive anything uh, because uh, for, for, for reasons we don't know actually. So there were also some uh, weird decision by the authorities at some point to upload some fake keys with some validity date, which was uh, post dated. So it could ease one of the attack I presented before. So there was a problem with bypassing the token verification. Other problem is that the COVID code, so this app is supposed to work much faster than contact tracing, but in practice, the COVID code can be very long to deliver to people. So, so uh, sometimes it takes two days or even more. So it's, uh, it's kind of crazy that people have to wait several days to receive the credential to be able to uh, report after they are diagnosed. 
and the relevant period uh, maybe it will be enlarged uh, uh, currently the law says uh, the codes that you can report are only two days before the symptoms appear but now some studies say that probably you're contagious uh, even before those two days before the symptoms appear uh, so either we have to revisit the law or uh, to bypass it but uh, maybe it's, it won't be sufficient. And there is also a problem of interoperability. So since now many countries have adopted the Google and Apple uh, architecture, so the question is to make them interoperable. So interoperable is working, except in Switzerland, because so far the uh, Europe, uh, uh, European Union has said that uh, the Swiss law on privacy is insufficient. For this reason, they don't want interoperability with the Swiss app uh, so far. So people are still working on uh, how to solve this problem, but uh, there is no interoperability at this time. Uh, we can talk also about the adoption. So, so far, 18% of the population are actively uh, using Swiss COVID, which is actually a pretty high number but uh, which doesn't look to be sufficient uh, to, to defeat the pandemic. So we can also measure that between 10 and 15 percent of diagnosed people are actually reporting using Swiss COVID. So among all the people who are diagnosed, 10 to 15 percent are reporting using Swiss COVID. So that's an impressive number. But if we use those two figures, if we multiply them together, so it means that if there is a contaminating proximity between two persons in Switzerland, the probability is bounded by two percent. The probability that Swiss COVID will detect this proximity will be bounded by two percent. That's assuming that Bluetooth is working uh, correctly and etc. So you can see that the uh, effect can be uh, very small in that case, and this computation is very simplistic. So one problem is how to increase the adoption. So authorities have adopted uh, some strategies, like sometimes they send some uh, weird uh, SMS to to wide uh, population in Switzerland, inviting to uh, to install Swiss COVID. They have been active on TikTok. So maybe I can show you uh, how it looks. I hope you will be able to hear. Okay, so I hope you see what kind of uh, campaign we can have. And with this, the project is to increase the adoption. There are also some weird proposal by economists which says that instead of asking people to install, just install it by default and ask them to opt out if they don't want to, to do. So it was some proposal. It has not been uh, the direction so far, but it's likely to, to, to happen, I think. Uh, the other problem is the usefulness. We can wonder if it is useful uh, at all. Uh, problem is that this app is giving very little data, so it, it, it's hard to see if it is working at all. So Vanessa mentioned it's a problem with the COVID safe. It's even worse with, uh, with Swiss COVID. Even to count how many people are using it, you need to deploy lots of tricks to count how many people are using. So to count how many people, it's not some information which is easy to get. And we can, what is easy to get is the number of reports, the number of people who report uh, using Swiss COVID after they are diagnosed. But there is no way to count how many people were notified. What we can count is how many people called the info line. And of course, we can make surveys. So. Uh, latest news. So last week there was a paper released by uh, 20 co-authors uh, uh, in Switzerland. So um, a vast majority of those co-authors are from EPFL actually. And there are also many co-authors uh, who are from uh, the uh, Swiss National Science uh, Task Force. So it's likely that this uh, paper will, will be the official uh, uh, proof of uh, effectiveness of uh, Swiss COVID. Uh, there is also someone from the health uh, authority uh, who is a co-author. 
So what they have uh, shown in this paper, so they, they, they make a survey, they're collecting data. They say during the test period, so probably it's during the entire lifetime of uh, Swiss COVID since it was deployed, uh, there are 8,500 uh, people who were uh, diagnosed in Switzerland. For those people, they, uh, and for the Swiss COVID users, they emitted some COVID codes, like uh, roughly 1,600 COVID codes. And from those emitted codes, only 1,000 entered it. So 1,000 people reported using, uh, using a Swiss COVID. So 1,000 is 12% of the number of positive tests. So that's a number uh, I indicated before. And once those codes are entered, they can count how many people call the info line because they were notified and there were 874 people who called. So it means that for each COVID code, there is roughly 0 0.83 people who call the info line. Now, how many of those people were tested positive? It's some information which is not available in their paper. We can wonder if it is the number of 13, which was announced in the public, uh, in the press uh, conference one week before the release of this paper by one of the co-author. If it is 13, so it means that uh, you have 1.5% of people who call who are effectively positive, 1.5%. So it means that all others are notified for, uh, uh, for uh, nothing. Uh, another result is that for all those people who were tested positive, some indicated why they wanted to be tested. Uh, and the reason is known for this number of people. For uh, nearly all of them, uh, it's because they have symptoms. So if they have symptoms, it means that probably they were suggested by their physician to, to get a test. So they are part of the health system and it's uh, covered by the health insurance. But otherwise, the other reason, uh, 26 indicated is because they were notified by Swiss COVID. Uh, there is, I, I mentioned there is a financial incentive to give this as a reason because you can have a free test in that case. Uh, so probably those 26 people were notified and they indicated this reason to be tested. Uh, so we can wonder how many effectively were notified. And in this paper, they derived, they did some computation, which are not well detailed, but some smart computation. And they estimated the number to 37. So it means that it's zero to dot, uh, 67%. Another result from this paper is a test from the uh, people from the Zurich uh, state, the canton of uh, Zurich. So there were uh, 1,200 people positively tested and out of this population, they extracted a population of 96 samples. And for these 96 samples, I've shown some figures. They have seen in those 96 people uh, positive, 53 were Swiss COVID users. We can see already that there is a, a problem because 53 is 55 percent. So it's much larger than the 18 percent I've shown you before. So we don't know if it means that this population is not representative or if it means that there is a weird correlation between being a Swiss COVID user and being tested positive or living in Zurich. I don't know. So uh, probably there is some correlation which is hidden, which is not analyzed here. Out of those 53 Swiss COVID users, uh, 48 entered a COVID code. So again, that's 87%. It's much larger than the two thirds that we, numbers that we have seen before. Regular contact tracing on those 96 people identify 82 very close relatives of those people. And in those 82 relatives, 60 were Swiss COVID users. So again, it's a proportion which is very strange. And out of these 60 Swiss COVID users, 23 were notified. So we can uh, assume that those 25 notified people are the close relative of those 48 people, but we don't know at all if there were other relatives which were not notified, so this paper is not mentioning. And we don't know at all how many of those relatives have become positive after a test. So it's also uh, something which is missing. 
So what, she, what is uh, really strange is that with those numbers, they, they, they conclude that it is a success because uh, with this number, it shows that Swiss clothing is working. <coughs> For me, I, I have some hard time to convince myself that it's a, a proof of uh, efficiency. So probably you have your uh, own opinion. So we can wonder why there is no more user. Uh, so the authorities are trying uh, actively to collect more user, uh, but uh, it's pretty hard. Uh, one, uh, some people think that it's because of privacy. People are scared of losing their privacy if they use Swiss COVID. Frankly, I don't think this is a problem. I don't think that people care so much about privacy. Uh, one problem is that Swiss COVID doesn't work uh, uh, for everyone. It doesn't work for people who don't have smartphones, obviously, and it doesn't work on all the smartphones. <clears throat> it doesn't wor work on smartphones which are too old or on smartphones which are too new and Chinese because of the uh, uh, the American uh, politics, uh, the embargo to, to technology to, to China. So on ver brand new Chinese smartphones, uh, Swiss COVID doesn't work. It doesn't work either on uh, the Google Android phones. So there are people who want to use Android, but they don't want Google. So they remove everything which is connected to Google. And of course, on those phones, uh, Swiss COVID doesn't work. So it doesn't work for many people. Uh, for maybe for people on which it may work, people can be can have their smartphone which is already overloaded with apps, which has probably their, maybe their memory is already saturated, and they don't want to install an, yet another app. There are also people. Uh, who don't want to turn Bluetooth on. So actually in my case, uh, I always turn off Bluetooth when I don't need Bluetooth and I don't want to turn it on. And I try to avoid to turn Bluetooth uh, as much I, 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 as I can because you know that with Bluetooth technology, there are attacks which are frequently discovered. It happened uh, against, uh, I think one or two months ago. Uh, and it was feasible for people to, uh, to intrude on the smartphone through Bluetooth and to, to do some nasty attack. Uh, another reason why uh, there are no more users is, is that because it's really boring app, it's not a game, it's not a communication app, it's, it's an app which is doing nothing except uh, uh, giving a promise to uh, give a notification and to give essentially bad news. So it's an app which will only give bad news to people. And, and this bad news will put people in troubles. So if someone receives a notification, uh, it can be uh, terrible for, for people. So for, for people like me, for instance, if I have to uh, quarantine, I stay home and I can continue to work and can even give conferences in Israel by staying home. But for many people, staying home means not being able to work and it means some income loss. Uh, maybe some people will not receive salaries. There are some people independent who will not receive any income. Uh, in some cases, they can have some subsidies, but those subsidies will not fully cover their loss. So for many people, uh, this app is just an app which really puts them into trouble. So probably that's, uh, I think in my opinion, that's the main reason why there are no more uh, users. Uh, I would like also to make a list of all the goals which were announced by DP3T and which were not met. So I look at the uh, white paper and uh, I listed some goals. So originally there was a goal to give data to epidemiologists. So of course this, uh, this was dropped and, and this uh, goal was uh, not uh, met. Um, probably it's because Apple and Google doesn't allow this. Uh, the open source, we discussed it. Uh, there is a problem of the Apple and Google implementation, uh, which is not really open source. It's hard to verify, it's not complete. Uh, the decentralized, essentially, uh, 
by being decentralized, what it does is that it stores data on some memory, which is distributed in smartphones, but controlled by Apple and Google. So it means it's a Google and Apple repository, which is distributed in smartphones. So this is what it means to be decentralized. Maybe it's decentralized, but maybe it's not fully decentralized in the way uh, we want it. For the privacy preserving, uh, act actually it can be argued so it protects privacy but not as much as it could so it's still far from the ideal privacy preservation even uh, the one we can expect uh, from an ideal uh, contact tracing application contact tracing will never be privacy preserving but we can try to uh, identify what is the ideal privacy preservation of contact tracing and I think that risk of it is not, uh, not, uh, still not close to it. Uh, one goal of DP3T was to have what they call completeness, which means that all the uh, close proximities will be spotted by the app. And we can see that it's not the case. So there are some close proximities which are not spotted, spotted. The precision, it means that if a contact is spotted, it means that it was corresponding to some proximity, but sometimes, uh, it, uh, it's also not the case sometimes you can spot uh, contacts which, has, uh, which are at a distance larger than 1.5 meter. Authenticity, so that's the problem that we, you cannot forge, uh, forge uh, proximities and with real attacks you can see that it's, uh, this goal is not met and for interoperability, interoperability maybe it will work for the next vacation but so far it doesn't work. We can wonder if privacy matters, so we're in a summer school talking about privacy, we can wonder if it matters. Uh, remember that the law of epidemic says that you can reduce privacy if it is necessary and reasonable. And very often there are some politicians who try to reduce more dr drastically privacy. So this is a quote from uh, the head of the government of the state of Bern who say that we should definitely know if we want to fight against this pandemic or if we shall be stopped on details about data protection. So privacy is just a detail and we shouldn't be stopped by this kind of detail. So that's a kind of uh, statement by politicians that we can hear very frequently and uh, most likely very soon. I think there will be some more drastic uh, cases. So actually, for instance, in in some bars in Zurich, so you remember that uh, the uh, Swiss COVID was meant to be uh, uh, used on a voluntary basis. In some bar in Zurich, now they say that all customers must either use Swiss COVID or wear a mask. So they bypass the non-discrimination law by saying that it's non-mandatory, we don't discriminate, they have the choice, either they use it or they wear a mask. So that's, uh, that's a kind of a twist of the first intention that we can uh, realize. Another problem, uh, I think I'm running out of time. Another problem that we have now is that there is a bunch of people who are defeating the law on Swiss COVID. Uh, you know that in Switzerland, when some people don't like a law, they have a delay during three months, they can collect signatures and if they collect enough signature, I think it's 50, uh, 55,000, uh, then it forces the law to go to some referendum. So it means that people have to vote whether they accept it or not. So there is a referendum against uh, the law on Swiss COVID, which is going on. Uh, they're collecting signatures. We don't know how many signatures they collected so far, and it will run until uh, beginning of October. Uh, and uh, we can, uh, uh, maybe there will be some political debate about it. We can wonder what those people are saying against this law on Swiss COVID. So those people, uh, they are not taken seriously usually either by media or by uh, politicians. They are called conspirationists and it just trashes all their argument. Uh, I think it's a mistake not to pay attention to what they say. Uh, because probably that there is a piece of truth out in what they say and, and, we, uh, and I think that what is more important is that we need to answer them. So they, they, they have a message and they have some worries and, and we have to, to answer them. So they are citizens, they are voting, they are paying taxes and I think we, we should serve them as well. 
so I try to spend some time to, to understand what they say. Um, I have watched lots of videos, I've read many things, so I'm sorry that I must be brainwashed uh, at this time. But uh, here is what I understood. So first I say that the pandemic that we are living in is not visible if we look at the statistic of deaths. The statistic of disease is lower, uh, at least in Switzerland, than in the previous year. So there is no effect of the pandemic at all. And locking down and wearing masks is some measure which are non-proportional and which are even dangerous. Because if you lock down, you decrease the immune system of people, people, people stay home. If you wear masks, they don't breathe normally, so it's also dangerous for health. They say that the government is actually trying to scare people. So it's quite clear that the government is jumping on figures which are scary to uh, communicate on the scary figures and the media follows. The media also love to, to show some uh, scary uh, figures. There is too much emphasis on, uh, on the data and sometimes there, there is some data which is fake. Uh, it's not intentionally fake, it's a mistake, but it shows how greedy are people to show scary data. So several times uh, the government, uh, the health authority have announced a tragic death on some young people to show that we should worry. But every time it was shown to be wrong. So for instance, once they have announced the tragic death of a young girl, a uh, young nine years old uh, girl, uh, but later after checking, so they, they have checked that uh, in, uh, in the information the, which was filled for this uh, girl, the uh, year uh, uh, of birth was shown as 11 and they thought it was 2011, but in fact it was 1911. So sh this young girl was actually 109 years old instead of nine years old. And this mistake also appeared in different forms several times. So several times they, they jump on some news to, to try to scare people, but they had to correct uh, themselves. Uh, next, those people are scared that there will be a mandatory vaccine. So they don't like vaccines, they sus suspect vaccine will not work, as they suspect it will be developed in a rush. I'm sorry, uh, we're a bit out of uh, over time. Um, okay. A bit. Uh, so they say turn off TV and turn on your brain. Uh, there are lots of crazy theories that nobody wants to run into it. And what is the reaction of authorities and Swiss government people? Here it is. Uh, and maybe I will uh, go to the final part. Uh, there is some obscene competition at this time. So you have seen people fighting for toilet papers, countries fighting to buy masks, a race for vaccine. Uh, the rest of countries, uh, countries to announce a vaccine and some competition to buy some vaccines which do not uh, exist. And what is carrying me the most is uh, the problem of science, which doesn't show well these days. So now experts are contradicting each other and there are lots of experts who have conflict of interest and who just communicate based on their conflict of interest. There is a lot of bites, bad science going on. And, uh, the, and there, is, there are some fights between experts, which is not publicly visible. And people are now looking at how science works, how some journals are badly working as well. And I think we have a lot to lose uh, in these uh, stories. So I would like to show you something which uh, I think is fundamental. So that the ethics in science, since the very beginning, I was uh, quite impressed by this communication by the European Network of Research Integrity Offices, which states something which is uh, most uh, targeting, uh, it, it's mostly targeting life science, but it works in other domain. It shows how we should uh, think uh, of our behavior in science. It says that researchers should communicate their work on social and other media responsibly with professionalism and transparency Subjective or unfounded interpretations must be avoided and information must uh, not be intentionally omitted. Eroding the integrity of research undermines the trust of our colleagues, the public and policy makers. And I really recommend you to read the full version of this uh, statement because I think it's fundamental and we should really think before uh, we act in science. 
so to conclude, so maybe privacy is not the major worry that we have in Swiss COVID. So usefulness is not proven. There is a problem of miscommunication. And uh, I recommend people to be very careful when they communicate in science because they're really playing with the reputation of science. Uh, I will just take the quote from the people we call conspirationists, turn off the TV and turn on your brain, but I would add, use it wisely. And I hope that this nightmare will end uh, well and very soon, hopefully. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thank you, Serge. Uh, as we are a bit over time, we want to give uh, enough time for people to eat lunch. Um, so uh, I'll pass it back to Or. Thank you very much, Serge and Ayal. And thank you also, Vanessa. Uh, we're going to take a lunch break and we will reconvene at a one Israel time zone, the 12th Central European time zone. They like saving time, and I'm not going to give the entire uh, schedule, the entire translation to 24 different time zones. Israel is currently GMT plus three, so. Um, and we're going to have UTC plus three. UTC plus three, sorry. Greenwich Daylight Saving Time plus two. Um, and we're going to have Carmela Trancos, who is from the dp 3 project, who is going to explain how the design worked. And later on, we're going to have a panel. So, bon appetit and see you in 45 minutes. 40 minutes. Sorry.